Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California here in Studio MC2 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and get into the cool stuff that I found for this episode. Starting off over at cnet.com, Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer to retire within 12 months. This has been announced today, Friday. I'm recording this Friday night, August 23rd. Earlier today, this was announced. Uh, this is huge news. Um, he is going to retire uh, as Microsoft CEO. He's going to retire from that position within the next 12 months. He will remain as chief executive uh, until the board of directors chooses someone to succeed him. He said that there's never a perfect time for this sort of transition, but now is the right time. Um, they've embarked on a new strategy with a new organization, and they have an amazing senior leadership team. And his original thoughts on timing would have had him retiring uh, in the middle of the company's transformation to a devices and services company. And really, Microsoft needs a CEO who will be here, there longer for that new direction. So he's decided to cut it short a little bit. Uh, you know, basically, he's doing what he's perceiving is what's best for the company, and you can't blame him. Um, he uh, said more in an internal email that was sent to, you know, company employees. Uh, so they're uh, basically, uh, you know, he's going to be gone in probably six months or less. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens there. From The Verge, The Verge, that's right, Analog Strikes Back. The next Star Wars film is going to be shot on film, not digital. Director J.J. Abrams, who recently signed on to direct the next installment in the Star Wars series, has shot, has shot his movies exclusively in film, and it turns out that won't be changing anytime soon. Boba Fett fan club reports that cinematographer Dan Mindel discusses, discussed the use of Kodak film on the set of Episode 7 at an industry event in Los Angeles this week. As a bold move, more than half a decade after 4K digital shooting first became practical, episodes 2 and 3 were shot digitally, so Abrams' decision is a return to the old school. He may be looking to preserve the look and feel of the original three movies. You know, I, I actually don't have a problem with shooting on film. As much as I like digital and as much as I think, you know, digital... Uh, you know, has, has made a lot of progress. The reality of the matter is, you know, film is still very much the gold standard. So, um, you know, and that's not going to change probably for a while, uh, particularly in latitude, you know, exposure latitude and that sort of, I mean, there's, there's still a lot to that, you know, film still got quite a bit of miles left at it. They are at the top of the cinema, you know, at the, the top of the, if you've ever watched this movie that, there's a documentary called Side by Side. Uh, you can get it on iTunes. I think it's available on Netflix. Anyway, uh, I've seen it several times. And, you know, film, the film process, if you will, of shooting on film is kind of like, you know, at, at its peak. It's not going to really get any better than what it is now. However, with that being said, um, a lot of the back end stuff, even though they're acquiring on film, a lot of the back end stuff is digital. And so there's kind of this uh, mesh of film and digital. And a lot of filmmakers are saying, well, why are we going through all this expense? Let's just shoot digital. And until recently, the last year or so, you know, digital didn't quite have. The color space didn't quite have the exposure latitude, didn't quite have, there's, there was a lot of stuff that digital still didn't quite have, you know, it was getting close, but it still wasn't quite there. And, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, the newer cameras are starting to get to where it's like, okay, you know, we can make this work. So 
It'll be interesting to see. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a problem with it as long as it's a clean picture. What I don't like is seeing film grain. I, I know, you know, film grain means that you don't have that much resolution. If you can see film grain on, you know, a 40-foot screen and you're sitting in the middle of the theater, I'm sorry, but you're, you know, film at that point is not higher quality. Regardless, uh, next story, Geeky Gadgets, uh, iWork iCloud beta is now available to all Apple account holders. So if you are an Apple account holder, you can now try out uh, the iWork beta for iCloud. Should be pretty interesting. Um, I'll be uh, giving that a uh, look-see to see what uh, cool things I can do with that. From O Gizmo, there is a record-breaking Lego tower that is, wait for it, 11 stories high. That is a lot of Lego. That's all I got to say. Uh, there's a YouTube video here. You can check it out. They've got some pictures. That's a very, very, <laughs> very tall. Uh, whew, boy, that's a lot of bricks. That's all I got to say. That is a lot of bricks. Uh, from Tom's Hardware, in pictures, Puget Systems 16-core Genesis 2 Quiet Edition. That's right. Uh, there's a walkthrough here. Uh, the, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a slideshow, but the, the beginning caption is, uh, and this is from uh, the Best of Media team there at Tom's Hardware, I thoroughly enjoy building my own PCs, upgrading parts, and reforming my, reformatting my SSD to the glorious performance of a clean system. So do I. But I also have a lot of respect for the boutique system builders who were, and usually still are, enthusiasts themselves. They simply made selling PCs their work too. Every so often, one of them sends along a bit about a recent project, and I'll ask for the backstory for Tom's Hardware. Last time John Bach, president of Puget Systems, told me about one of his projects was back in 2009, where Tom's Hardware published a, what does a $16,000 PC look like anyway? It was four quad-core Opterons, 32 gigs of RAM, and something like six terabytes of storage. $16,000 in 2009. That's a pretty beefy system. Uh, recently, uh, they have sent over the details on another 16-core setup with 64 gigs of RAM, and it was half as much, about $7,400. So uh, the specs weren't even the highlight. What the highlight of that was is it was quiet and Building a quiet computer, the author can tell you, and I can tell you personally, because I have built several of them. One of them is that computer right there. You can't hear it right now. It's not a beefy computer like that is, but I've got several terabytes of storage in that thing and not a wimp for a CPU and not a small amount of RAM. And there's nothing wimpy about that computer right there you can't really see it but it's right there and you can't hear it right now because it's quiet despite the fact that i have all that storage in there anyway um not an easy feat building a quiet system that stays cool not easy at all so uh definitely go through take a look at this pretty interesting um i thought so and i thought i'd share it with you guys from wired.com is that computer for real there may finally be a test pretty interesting uh in early may news reports gushed that a quantum computation device had for the first time outperformed classical computers solving certain problems thousands of times faster the media coverage sent ripples of excitement through the technology community a full-on quantum computer, if ever built, would revolutionize large swaths of computer science, running many algorithms dramatically faster, including one that could crack the most, most encryption protocols in use today. However, quantum computing has its problems. Over the following weeks, vigorous controversy has surfaced. Experts argued over whether the device created by D-Wave Systems in British Columbia, British Columbia really offers the claimed speed ups and whether it works the way the company thinks it does and even whether it's really harnessing the counterintuitive weirdness of quantum physics, which governs the world of elementary particles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So 
I thought it was a pretty interesting read. Uh, it's a little out there, but still pretty cool nonetheless. Uh, from Hackaday, a comparison of hacker-friendly SDRs. They've got a nice little rundown of software-defined radios that are hacker-friendly, uh, meaning you can get in there and do s cool stuff with it. So uh, check that out if you're into software-defined radios. And from Mashable.com, this, I simply because I'm kind of a photography buff, if you've got an old SLR camera that uses film, you can turn it into a digital camera. That's right. Uh, the story starts, they have a video clip here. Definitely uh, check it out. It's a couple of minutes long. For James Jackson, a 58-year-old professional photographer, a traditional SLR camera represents an almost bygone era of photography. And with the rapid disappearance of 35 millimeter film developers, it seems these relics might soon become extinct. Jackson is attempting to save the camera of his youth with his Digipod campaign on Indiegogo, which is raising funds for the creation of a digital film pod to replace analog film and thus keep the cameras in use. Great idea. It's not quite the same as a digital back that you can get for, mo for many cameras, but still, nonetheless, uh, he explains that he wanted the Digipod to be as versatile as possible in the space available, so there's no hard memory. Everything is saved to a micro SD card, and it has a mini USB port for direct connection to a computer and a built-in battery. Uh, the Digipod is small and versatile enough to, do, to adjust to any SLR film camera and even some non-SLRs and many of the Digipod's features harken back to the bygone era of photography, but therein lies the appeal of the product. So I actually think this is pretty cool. I might check this out. You can reserve your own Digipod for $300. Uh, he's looking to raise a little over $309,000. There's about 31 days left at the time of writing, and he's got more than $11,000 already raised, so pretty interesting. Uh, I'm curious to see what comes of this. I will definitely be looking into this. Um, anyway, that's pretty much it for this edition of the Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show, and with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. See you then. Bye.